Hello and welcome to the Figure Preparation and Image Editing Workshop. I'm Curtis Clavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. This is the third of three sessions on figure preparation and image editing for grant applications and journal publications. The first session covered concepts and tools related to image editing. The second session covered common workflows. And in this third and final session, we'll be covering advanced image editing techniques. It's important to note that these sessions are designed to provide information about image editing for grant applications, digital presentations, and journal publications. These sessions are not intended to cover techniques and tools that should be used when processing images for scientific analysis. However, many of the concepts and tools covered in this workshop are relevant to image processing for analysis and should serve as a good introduction for those looking to do more advanced image analysis work. For this session, we'll be using the same software tools we used in sessions 1 and 2 to generate and edit image files. We'll also be using a new software tool called ImageJ. If you haven't done so already, you can download and install the software we will be using for the rest of this session for OS X, Windows, or Linux. We will be using the GNU Image Manipulation Program which can be downloaded from www.gimp.org. We will also be using OpenOffice Draw, which can be downloaded from www.openoffice.org. OpenOffice Draw is part of the OpenOffice suite of programs. We'll be using ImageJ, which we haven't used in the previous sessions. ImageJ can be downloaded from http colon slash slash rsbweb dot nih dot gov slash ij. If you already have these programs installed on your computer, you should not need to install any additional software for this session. Finally, we will be working with some example files. Please download and unzip the session3files.zip file from www.pedonc.com. If you go to the site, click on Support, then select Figure Preparation and Image Editing, and click on the link to download session3files.zip. Whenever working with data, especially research data, it is critical to keep unaltered original copies of data files. Please extract and copy the Session 3 Files folder from the Session3Files.zip file. For this session, we'll be using GIMP version 2.8.10, OpenOffice version 4.0.1, and ImageJ version 1.47. There may be newer versions of these programs available now. In that case, please run the latest version of the software available. It should still be possible to follow along as most of the tools and concepts that will be covered are consistent across versions of the software. So here we are in the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which is known as GIMP. After starting GIMP for the first time, the program will take a while to load, as it will index all of the font files on your computer. Once GIMP has finished loading, there may be many different windows for the program open on screen. If this is the case, on Microsoft Windows, click the Windows menu in the center GNU Image Manipulation Program window. On an OS X machine, please make sure one of the GIMP windows is active by clicking on its title bar, then click on the Windows menu at the top of the screen. Select Single Window Mode from the Windows menu to consolidate everything into a single window. The new Single GIMP window may need to be dragged to be centered on screen, and should look like this. 
Go to the File menu, select Open, then go to the copy of the Session 3 Files folder and open cells.png. An 8-bit per channel RGB bitmap image of cells appears in the main GIMP workspace. Let's convert this image to grayscale color space. Go to the image menu, select mode, and note that RGB is checked, indicating that the image is currently in RGB color space. Click grayscale to convert the image to grayscale color space. The color data for the image is discarded and the bitmap appears in black and white in the main GIMP workspace. In grayscale, there is only a single channel. The minimum intensity value in this channel is black and the maximum intensity value in this channel is white. All intermediate intensity values represent gray values. Go back to the image menu. Select Mode and click RGB to convert back to RGB color space. Notice that the image does not regain its original colors since we discarded the color data when converting to grayscale. Click on the Color Picker tool in the toolbox. Ensure that Set Foreground Color is selected in the Tool Options dialog and that the other tool options are configured as displayed here. With these settings, the Color Picker tool allows us to set the foreground color to the color of a pixel we click on in the image. Move the mouse cursor over the image canvas and click to set the foreground color. Move the mouse around the canvas and click on different areas of the image and notice that the foreground color swatch in the toolbox changes accordingly. Now click on the foreground color swatch. In the Change Foreground Color window that appears, note that the R, G, and B values for the foreground color are all numerically identical. This is because when the image was converted to grayscale, there was only a single intensity value for each pixel. Converting back to RGB, this single intensity value per pixel became the intensity value for red, the intensity value for green, and the intensity value for blue for each pixel. In RGB color space, white, black, and intensities of gray are called neutral colors, as the R, G, and B values for these colors are all identical. When an image capturing device, like a camera, generates an image, the sensor in the device may incorrectly detect colors from the scene. This can shift colors so that colors which should be neutral, such as white, gray, or black, do not have identical RGB intensity values in the produced image. Other colors in the image may also have inaccurate intensity values. Color balancing adjusts the intensity values in an image. One method for balancing colors is to find pixels in the image that should be neutral but whose intensity values for R, G, and B don't match then determine a color transform that when applied to the intensity values for these pixels would shift their R, G, and B values to be identical. This same transform can then be applied to all pixels in the image to shift all pixel intensity values and correct for any color bias in the acquisition device. Let's look at ways that we could do this in GIMP. 
go to the file menu and select close all and discard changes when prompted. Then go back to the file menu and select open and open the original cells.png file. Colors in this image are already pretty close to balanced, but, but let's look at how we might modify them if they weren't. Go to the Colors menu and select Color Balance. In the Color Balance window that appears, make sure that Preview is checked. Then toggle Options for Select Color Range to adjust and manipulate values under Adjust Color Levels to see how changes transform colors in the image. Color balancing can be used appropriately to compensate for color bias in an acquisition device. However, it can also be applied inappropriately and can distort image data. In photography, one good way to determine an appropriate color transform to balance an image is to acquire an image of a color checker with known color intensities in a scene. This can be used to determine any bias if these colors are inaccurate in an acquired image. Please be certain not to use color transforms inappropriately to balance images for scientific analysis. Acquisition instrument vendors or image acquisition specialists, such as microscopy specialists, should be consulted for guidance on device color bias, color balancing, and analyzing captured images. Click the Cancel button to close the Color Balance window. GIMP also includes tools that will determine and apply certain color transforms automatically. Again, these should only be used appropriately. To demonstrate one of these tools, go to the Colors menu and select Auto, then Normalize. Normalize transforms intensity values in the image so that the darkest point in the image becomes black and the brightest point becomes as bright as possible without altering its hue. Since this image is already well balanced, there is only a subtle transform when the image is normalized. Color balancing can be critical to compensate for color bias in an image but should be applied only when appropriate, and it is critical to use a color accurate display for manual color balancing. Let's look a bit more at selecting pixels in a bitmap image. Suppose we wanted to select only pixels in a certain color range in an image. We could do this by using the Select by Color tool. Click on the tool in the toolbox. Ensure that the tool options are configured as displayed here. Click on a white pixel in the image and notice that other similarly colored pixels are also selected. This can be a useful way of selecting areas of pixels in an image. Adjusting the threshold option for the tool will expand or contract the range of similar color pixels that are selected by the tool. Go to the Select menu and click None. Another useful option for working with bitmap images is to work with image layers. Towards the upper right of the GIMP window, Click on the Layers tab to display the Layers dialog. If the Layers tab is not visible, click on the left triangle icon in the upper right corner of the window, select Add Tab, then click to add the Layers tab.
The Layers tab lists various layers in the file. Currently, there is only a single layer, cells.png. Click the Create a New Layer icon at the bottom left of the Layers dialog. In the new layer window that appears, make sure that the layer fill type is set to transparency. Set the layer name to Brush, then click OK. In the Layers dialog, a new layer appears above the Cells.png layer. Select the Brush tool, set the foreground color to black using the Color Reset swatch, set the brush size to around 100 in Tool Options, then move the mouse cursor over the image canvas and click and drag to paint some black pixels. This operation has only painted pixels on the current layer. Click the eye icon to the left of the new brush layer in the layers dialog to hide the current layer. Notice that our newly painted pixels disappear from the workspace. Click the eye icon next to the new layer to display the layer again. Click the Create a New Layer icon in the Layers dialog to create a new layer and make sure that the options for the layer are as configured here. Enter Gradient as the layer name. then create the new layer. Another tool that can be used to paint pixels is the Blend tool. The Blend tool can be used to paint a gradient where adjacent pixels have gradually different colors. Make sure that the foreground and background colors are set to their default black and white values. Then click on the Blend tool in the toolbox. Ensure that the tool options are as configured here. Then move the mouse cursor over the image canvas. Click and drag with the mouse from the left side of the canvas towards the right side of the canvas to draw a horizontal line across the image canvas, then release the mouse button. A black and white gradient appears, filling the image canvas. This gradient is only on the current layer. In the Layers dialog, Click and drag the top layer containing the gradient below the middle layer and release the mouse button. Notice that the pixels we painted with the brush appear over the gradient. Click and drag the gradient layer again to position it below the cells.png layer in the layer list. The gradient layer's pixels are no longer visible as they are occluded by the cells.png layer's pixels. Layers can be very helpful especially in working around limitations inherent in destructive editing of bitmap images. By constraining bitmap image operations to particular layers, it can be easier to compare and hide different changes to an image. 
there are lots of powerful ways to duplicate and combine layers that should be explored. GIMP's native XCF file type will save and preserve image layers. Many bitmap image file types cannot preserve layers and will merge all layers that are visible into a single layer when exporting. We have discussed using various tools to select pixels in a bitmap. Another way of selecting pixels is to use painting tools to paint selection areas. This can be especially helpful when attempting to blend different bitmaps. In the Layers dialog, click the eye icons to hide all of the layers except the cells.png layer. Then single click on the cells.png layer in the layer list to make sure that it is the active layer. Click the Rectangle Select tool in the toolbox. Make sure that the tool options are configured as shown here. Then move the mouse cursor over the image canvas and click and drag to create a rectangular selection area in the middle of the image canvas. In the lower left corner of the GIMP workspace, click the broken square icon to switch to quick mask mode. With quick mask mode enabled, the areas of the image that are selected are clearly visible while the areas that are not selected are tinted red. Click the swatch to set the foreground and background colors to their default black and white colors, then click the paintbrush tool. In quick mask mode, when we paint black pixels on the image canvas, we deselect those areas. These deselected areas are tinted red in the workspace when in quick mask mode. When we paint white pixels, these areas are selected and appear normal in the workspace. Painting different intensities of gray allows us to select fractions of a pixel. Pixels that are painted brighter shades of gray in quick mask mode will be more opaque when selected. Pixels that are painted darker shades of gray in quick mask mode will be more transparent when selected. Paint some areas in the middle of the image black with the paintbrush. Then click the double arrow icon next to the foreground and background swatches to switch the foreground color to white and paint some areas that are tinted red in quick mask mode white to select them. Once you have finished, click the broken square icon in the lower left of the workspace to switch off quick mask mode. Notice that there are flashing dotted lines around the areas that we painted, indicating the areas that we selected in quick mask mode. Quick Mask is a very helpful option for selecting areas in an image. 
it can also be used for interesting artistic effects. Go to the Select menu and click None. Click the icon in the lower left corner of the workspace to switch to Quick Mask Mode. Click the Blend tool. Reset the foreground and background color swatches to their default values. Click and drag a line across the image, then release the mouse button to paint a gradient. Click the Quick Mask Mode button. Now go to the Edit menu and select Copy Visible. Click the eye icons next to the layers in the Layers dialog to hide all layers. Go to the Edit menu and select Paste as New Layer. A new layer named Clipboard appears in the Layer dialog. Drag this layer to the top of the layer list. Go to the Select menu and click None. Click to create a new layer in the Layers dialog. Name it Background and fill it with white. If necessary, drag the new layer so that it appears behind the blended cells layer. In the layer list, the clipboard layer should be at the top of the list, and the new background layer should be the second layer from the top of the list. We can see here how this sort of technique could be used to create compelling accents for different media. Go to the File menu and select Close All and Discard Changes. In the last workshop, we created a figure using some prepared vector graphics. Let's look at how some of those vector graphics were created. Go to the File menu and select Open. Then navigate to the copy of the Session 3 Files folder and open Sequencer.png. Let's imagine that we wanted to select the sequencer in this image. Click the Fuzzy Select tool. In Tool Options, set the threshold to 15 and ensure that the other tool options are set as shown here. Then move the mouse cursor over the white area around the sequencer and click the mouse button. The area around the sequencer is selected, but note that there are also some areas of the sequencer that are selected, which we don't want. Go to the Select menu and click None. In the Tool Options dialog, change the threshold to 3. Then click on a white area around the sequencer in the image. Now just the white area is selected. Since we want to select the sequencer and not the area around it, go to the Select menu and click Invert. 
Now just the sequencer is selected, which is what we want. Imagine that we wanted to save this selection area so that we could deselect it and reselect it as needed for future editing. In the upper right corner of the window, click on the Paths tab. If it is not visible, click the left triangle icon in the upper right corner of the window. Select Add Tab, then click to add the Paths tab. At the bottom of the Paths tab, click the Selection to Path button. A new path appears in the Paths dialog. Double-click on it and change its name to Sequencer. Now go to Select and click None. To reselect the sequencer, click Sequencer in the Paths dialog to select the path, then click the Path to Selection button at the bottom of the Paths dialog. In the workspace, the sequencer is selected. If we saved this image as an XCF file, the path would be saved in the file and we could use it to reselect the sequencer for future editing, even after closing the file. Even though it was created from a bitmap image, the path itself is a vector graphic. This can be used for creating contours for figures. In the Paths dialog, in Windows, right-click on the sequencer path. In OS X, hold the Control key on the keyboard and click on the sequencer path. From the pop-up menu, go to Export Path. In the window that appears, select a location to save the path, then enter the name sequencer.svg. Be sure to add the .svg extension. Save the path. We're finished using GIMP. So go to the File menu and select Close All. Discard any changes. Quit GIMP. Open OpenOffice Draw. Go to the File menu, select Open, then select Sequencer.svg. Click on the outline of the sequencer to select it. Then go to the Modify menu and click Break to release the outline from its mask and select only the sequencer shape. In Properties, in the Fill selection under Area, click the pull-down menu that reads None and select Color. Click the Paint Bucket menu and select Gray 7 to fill the shape with that color. This is how the sequencer vector graphic that we used in the last workshop was generated. Various sections of the original bitmap image of the sequencer were selected in GIMP and saved as paths. These paths were then exported as SVG and opened in OpenOffice Draw. They were edited slightly and then filled to create the vector graphic version of the sequencer for the last workshop. This technique can be very helpful in generating iconography for figures, presentations, and other media. In OpenOffice, go to the File menu and select Close, then Discard Changes. 
Another vector graphic we used in the last workshop was a DNA helix shape. Let's see how that was created. Go to the File menu, select New, and then Drawing to create a new empty drawing. Close the Pages pane if it is open. We can display a grid in OpenOffice Draw and use the grid as a guide when creating vector graphic objects. Go to the View menu, then Grid. Click on any of the three options that's unchecked. Repeat this procedure as necessary until all three options, Display Grid, Snap to Grid, and Grid to Front, are checked. We'll start by creating the curved shape that will represent an edge of the DNA helix. Click the arrow next to the Curve tool in the toolbar. Select the Curve tool and make sure not to select the Curve Filled tool. This tool can create Bezier curves which pass through control points and are shaped by tangents. Zoom in on the workspace until about eight vertical grid squares are visible using the zoom slider in the lower right corner of the window. With the curve tool selected, move the mouse over the workspace. The mouse cursor should be a cross shape with a curved X shape to its lower right. Center the mouse cursor on an intersection point on the grid towards the top center of the workspace window. Click and hold the mouse button. This sets the first control point for the curve. While still holding down the mouse button, drag the mouse down exactly three grid squares to hover over the intersection point on the grid three grid square units below the first control point. Release the mouse button. This sets the first tangent for the curve. Move the mouse cursor over two grid squares to the right. Then move the mouse cursor down three grid squares. The mouse cursor should now be at a grid intersection six grid squares below and two grid squares to the right of the first control point. Click and hold the mouse button to set the second control point. While still holding down the mouse button, drag the mouse up three grid squares. Release the mouse button to draw the tangent line. Now move the mouse cursor two or more grid squares to the right and double click the mouse to finish drawing the curve. With the curve selected, click on the points tool in the toolbar. The beginning of the curve we drew looks just like what we want but we need to get rid of that extra tail at the end of the curve. Single click on the rightmost control point at the end of the curve. Press delete on the keyboard to delete this control point. Then click the points tool to select the whole curve. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Select the Curve tool. Center the mouse cursor cross on the intersection point on the grid two grid squares to the right 
of the top control point of the curve we just drew and click and hold the mouse button. Holding down the mouse button, drag the mouse down exactly three grid squares to hover over the intersection point on the grid three grid square units below. Release the mouse button. Move the mouse cursor over two grid squares to the left, then down three grid squares. The mouse cursor should now be at a grid intersection six grid squares below and two grid squares to the left of the first control point of the curve we're currently drawing. Click and hold the mouse button, then drag the mouse up three grid squares and release the mouse button to draw the tangent line. Now move the mouse cursor two or more grid squares to the left and double click the mouse to finish drawing the curve. With the curve selected, click on the points tool in the toolbar. Single click on the leftmost control point at the end of the curve. Press delete on the keyboard to delete the control point. Then click the points tool to select the whole curve. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. With the selection tool active, click on the first curve and then hold the shift key and click on the second curve. With both curves selected, click the width pull down menu under the line section of properties and select six points. Click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Now we need to draw the horizontal rungs of the helix. Click the line tool in the toolbar. Move the mouse cursor to hover in the center of the top left of the first curve we drew and click and drag the mouse moving the mouse cursor to the right to draw a horizontal line. Move the mouse cursor to the center of the second curve and release the mouse button to draw a line. Click the Width pull-down menu in the Line section of Properties and select Six Points. Now that we've created a line just as we want it, we can copy it for the other ladder rungs. As you may know, on a Windows computer you can copy by holding the control key on the keyboard and tapping C, and paste by holding the control key on the keyboard and tapping V. On OS X you can copy by holding the command key on the keyboard and tapping C, and paste by holding the command key on the keyboard and tapping V. With the horizontal line we just created selected, use the keyboard to copy the line. Then use the keyboard to paste it. Press the down arrow on the keyboard five times. The new line moves down. However, this moves the line in small increments. So press the up arrow on the keyboard five times to return the line to its original position. Hold the shift key on the keyboard and press the down arrow to move the line down a larger distance. Use the keyboard to copy the new line, then paste the new line. Hold the shift key on the keyboard and press the down arrow. Repeat this procedure, copying the current line, 
pasting over that line, then holding shift on the keyboard and pressing the down arrow to move the newly pasted line down. Repeat until you've created rungs at regular intervals along the length of the helix. Now we'll need to adjust the ends of the rungs so they all are within the width of the outer curves of the helix. Because this will require more granular editing of the lines, go to the View menu, select Grid, and uncheck Snap to Grid. Using the Select tool, one by one, single click on a rung that extends outside the edge curves of the helix then move the mouse to either side of the line end click and drag the control point for the end of the line to move the line's end inside the width of the edge curve do this for all of the rungs Once this has been done for all of the rungs, click on an empty area of the workspace to deselect everything. Then, move the mouse cursor above and to the left of the helix. Click and drag with the mouse. While holding the mouse button down, drag the mouse to the lower right of the helix and release the mouse button to select all of the lines and curves. Go to the Modify menu and select Convert, then To Contour. Then go to the Modify menu and select Shapes, Merge. Now the helix is one shape. Go to the Paint Bucket pull-down under Fill in the Area Properties and select Orange. Now we have a helix shape like the one we used in the last session. It's possible to use similar techniques to generate vector shapes for other figures. When creating vector icons, it can be helpful to focus on creating distinguishable shapes with a minimum number of lines and colors. Building shapes this way can allow assets to be flexibly reused and adapted to different color schemes for different media. We're finished using OpenOffice, so go to the File menu and select Close. Discard any changes, then quit OpenOffice. Imagine that we have a bunch of images of cells from a microscope that we'd like to put into a digital presentation. These images may be high resolution and high bit depth TIFF files, which is exactly what we'd want for scientific analysis. However, they may be in a bit depth that is too high for integration in a presentation, as most software can only process up to 8 bit per channel RGB. Additionally, if we consider the limitations of digital projection, most standard meeting room projectors 
still have only 1024 by 768 pixels, which may be far, far fewer than the number of pixels in our original microscopy images. If we knew these images would always be smaller on screen than the full size of a slide in the presentation, we could create copies that were significantly smaller files with fewer pixels and lower bit depth that would still be appropriate for incorporating into a presentation. It is important to note that if we were to do this, we should keep our original images unaltered and make modified copies of the images for our presentation. We can use the program ImageJ to do this. Start up the ImageJ program on your system. Go to the File menu and select Open, then navigate to the copy of the Session 3 Files folder and open Cells.png. The images we'll be working with are 8-bit per channel RGB PNG files, but let's pretend that they are 16-bit per channel RGB TIFFs. ImageJ is designed for analyzing high bit depth images and is a good tool for image analysis. While the specific operations we'll perform are targeted at preparing images for presentation, the tools we'll cover can be used for other types of manipulation and analysis. In the cells.png window in ImageJ, we see that the file is 3000 pixels by 2000 pixels and is 23 megabytes, which is much larger than we would need for a digital presentation and could significantly slow down slide transitions in a presentation and bloat the presentation's file size. Go to the Plugins menu, select Macros, then select Record. In the Recorder window, ImageJ will record code for a program that will repeat the operations we perform. Click on the title bar of the cells.png window, then go to the image menu and select Scale. In the scale window that appears, set the X scale and Y scale to 0.5. For interpolation, select Bicubic from the pull-down menu to use a better quality downsampling method. Click the OK button. A window with the downsampled cell image appears. Close any windows that are open with the cell image. Then click the title bar of the recorder window. Notice that the recorder window contains a bunch of text with commands for the scale and close operations we performed. We could save this as a macro and replay the actions on other images, but for now, use the mouse to select all the text in the window, then use the keyboard to copy the text using Ctrl-C on Windows or Command-C on OS X. Close the recorder window. Now let's try to run a similar process to downsample a bunch of images for our presentation. It's very important to remember that before performing any batch operation like what we are about to do, we should copy the files that we will be using and perform the batch process on the copied files, keeping the original files safe. When running an automated batch operation, it is critical not to run actions on original files as the batch process could inalterably change the original images. Go to the Process menu and select Batch. Then select Macro. In the Batch Process window that appears, click the pull-down menu next to Add Macro Code then select Scale. Several lines of code are added in the text area of the window. Click with the mouse in the text area 
Then press the return key on the keyboard several times to add some line breaks to the end of the text. Press Ctrl V or Command V on your keyboard to paste in the text we copied from our earlier macro. Looking at the top line of code in the text area and comparing it to the commands we copied in, we want the scale factor to be 0.5, not 1.5. Using the keyboard, change the number on the first line to 0.5 and be sure to include the 0. This line of code sets a variable named scale to 0.5. The next line sets the W and H variables to the product of the current image's width and scale and the product of the current image's height and scale, respectively. The third line resizes the image with the calculated values, but notice that it is using bilinear instead of bicubic interpolation. Use the keyboard to change this to bicubic. Okay, all the commands look good, so use the keyboard to delete the other lines we added so that only the first three lines in the text area are present. Click the input button and select the cells directory in the session 3 files folder. Click on the output button and create and select a new folder named Output. Click the pull-down menu next to Output Format, then select PNG. Then click the Process button. The bottom of the ImageJ window will indicate the status of the batch process. When no more file updates appear, ImageJ has finished the batch process. Now, go to the File menu and select Open. Go to the Output directory and open Cells01.png. In the window that appears, we can see that this image is now 1500 by 1000 pixels and is 5.7 megabytes, which is much more reasonable to include in our presentation. ImageJ is a powerful tool for image manipulation and analysis. Using tools like this can greatly improve analysis and can save significant time by automating repetitive tasks. We're finished with ImageJ for now, so close all the windows and quit ImageJ. This has been the Figure Preparation and Image Editing Workshop. Over the three sessions of this workshop, we've covered color spaces, bit depth, bitmap and vector graphics formats, destructive versus non-destructive editing, software tools and concepts. Image editing is fun. The best way to gain familiarity and expertise with these concepts and tools is to use them frequently and when not up against a deadline. 
I recommend making a copy of your digital camera roll from your last vacation and experimenting. Try color balancing them and other editing, but just to be sure, as always, work with copies and keep the originals safe and unaltered. Also, please share techniques that you've learned with others. If you make your own figures better, through collaboration, you can help make your colleagues' figures better, too. I want to thank the developers of GIMP. Many people contributed to the project, but here are some of the lead developers. I also want to thank the developers of OpenOffice. Here are some of the lead developers for that project. I'd like to thank and acknowledge ImageJ developer Wayne Rasband, contributors to Wikimedia, Double Butter, and Illumina. I especially want to thank my colleague, Jonathan Huppy, without whom this workshop would not be possible. And finally, thank you very much for your time. I hope that this was helpful and that you'll share what you've learned with other colleagues. For more information, including sessions 1 and 2 of this workshop, please visit www.pdonk.com. Go to the support section, then go to Figure Preparation and Image Editing Workshop. I'm Curtis Glavin from the Pediatric Oncology Department at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute.